great subject for us all, interpretation of, of drug test results. So, Dr. Cooney, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the only thing you didn't say is I'm one of the more handsome forensic uh -huh. uh -huh. So, let me ask the question. I did give a talk similar to this one a couple of years ago. Was anybody here for that one? Yes. Oh my God. Okay. Well, that's good. I did. I did add some slides, but as you know, being an old codger like I am, I sometimes try to use a foundational approach that really covers the same subject. So, another uh, housekeeping thing I needed to tell you was I honestly thought this lecture was going to be an hour and a half. That was my fault. It wasn't anything. Um, uh, that, that was due to anyone else. So I probably have, in some respects, more material there that maybe we'll be able to cover. And if it turns out that we get through a little bit more than half of it or something and you felt like you haven't fallen asleep and you're willing to come back, I can, I can follow it up at a later time. But, but what I wanted to do is talk, talk about the interpretation of laboratory test results because uh, your work here is a little bit different in some respects than I deal with in some cases with uh, criminal defense attorneys. But there's an underlying uh, interest in what drugs uh, results mean and what they don't mean and one of my goals today will be to try to explain that. In fact, what I, I usually, when I go to a, a talk, I usually go because I think I'm going to get two or three interesting points that I didn't know when I came in. And then I'm hoping that maybe if the guy or the gal is good enough, maybe I'll have, I, I bring with me a couple of questions from my caseload and saying, I really want to know if trimethyl chicken wire is good or bad for my client's baby or whatever, and you need to get sort of an answer to that. So I, I decided, well, maybe I'd try to cover these four bullet points. One is just talk about the analytical approaches to drug testing, because there's a lot of potential misconfusion in terms of how agencies and uh, laboratories and maybe hospital settings or point of care testing, what they do and then what they imply the results mean. And so we need to understand what good toxicology is and as well as what is toxicology that remains to be finalized. Another thing is um, I'd like to talk about some basic pharmacological principles uh, because Many of you probably uh, uh, did not have a lot of anatomy and physiology and pharmacology. In fact, I was telling one young lady that most, most attorneys that I talked to will to say, well, Dr. Trudy, if I knew anything about toxicology, I wouldn't be an attorney. So I do understand that. And so no question is, is, is a bad one in the sense of what you're trying to do or trying to understand. The other thing is that we sometimes need to understand about the common effect of the drugs that you're dealing with, both over-the-counter as well as prescription drugs and illicit drugs. Before I was a toxicologist, I was a pharmacist, and so I, uh, I, I did a lot of consulting with individuals who were picking up their prescriptions and trying to tell them what to do and what sort of not to do. I also taught at the University of Texas Medical School for multiple years, and so I was the attending uh, toxicologist at Herman Hospital, which is the teaching hospital, which is another way of just saying I was, I was involved in a lot of people who came in in various types of, uh, with toxicological emergencies, because we had three helicopters and one fixed wing jet that went all over the southwest picking up people who ultimately would never make it if they were brought in by a uh, regular ambulance, if you will. And finally, um, and probably, to me, most important is to try to answer your question. So um, what I'm going to try to do is, as somebody who's good with a watch, when we have about 15 or 20 minutes left, and for those of you who are still awake, then if you have a question that you would like to ask, then maybe we can stop and do that. And then I will stay after the talk in case there's really a, a burning issue that you may Want to, want to get some insight into, or if I don't know the answer, I'll get you the answer, something that maybe was not covered today. Um, so toxicology itself is the study of poisons or the adverse effect of chemicals on living organisms. Uh, so if you, if you, if you 
take that in its completeness, it, it really covers a wide spectrum of, of compounds, and I'll explain why that is in just a moment. Because a poison is an agent that is capable of producing a deleterious response in some sort of biological system, which then results in some serious injuring a function within that organism, or in some cases, sort of producing death. Um, okay, now, what am I doing wrong, football fan? Now, toxicology has been around a long time, but actually, the father of toxicology <coughs> was a gentleman who was who was known uh, was named Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. <laughs> And his mother gave him the name Paracelsus. And he lived in the late 14th, uh, 1400s and mid 1500s. But he made a very profound <laughs> statement. He says, all things are poisons. There is none which is not a poison. And the only thing that separates a poison from a remedy is the dose. So invariably, when you're talking to a toxicologist, uh, you have to be aware of some things can be seem very innocuous, but every year people die of water intoxication. Okay, so anything can be uh, a, a toxin if indeed the dose is high enough. So Paracelsus is referred to as the father and founder of toxicology. Uh, now, in order to bring home this fact and in an attempt to try to keep most of you awake after you've eaten, I've tried to use a sort of a, a, uh, a situation that I became aware of while I was teaching at the University of Texas. And I'm not a Texan, but if you go to Texas, you need to be a Texan if you're going to exist. And so every year they have the annual country, uh, statewide county fair, uh, state fair. And as a part of that, there is what's called the chili cook-off. Now, those of you who have been here before may have remembered I used this to bring home a point. And the point <coughs> is, it's dose-related. In this case, it's going to be sort of indirectly alcohol-related. So what happens is the chief, there, there are three judges for this chili cook-off, and the ch chief judge is just getting off the phone, finding out that one of his judges of the three could not make it, and he needs a third judge. And just at that time, a young man who's from out of state comes up and he says he's looking for the Budweiser truck because he wants to drink beer. The judge puts the two together and says, well, I tell you what I can do. If you're willing to be a judge in the chili cook-off, I'm willing to give you as much beer as you want. The guy said, boo, that's a win-win. That's a <laughs> so that's what he does. So throughout this presentation, not on your handout, because I, I, I thought I might get my hand slapped here. I have this little uh, sequence. So in between portions of my talk, we'll look at that. Because in the end, there are eight chilies that are being evaluated, okay? Eight chilies. So let's try to start out with the first one. The first one is Mike's mon uh, Maniac Monster, Monster, Monster Chili, okay? I feel bad for you guys, old ladies over here. But can you see it? Yeah, okay. I can well, I can yak. Okay, so again, there's two judges. The first two judges are the real judges. And what I'll do is I'll let you just read those. I won't, I won't try to mimic that. Uh, but then again, now the third judge is our friend Frank. Okay? So what does Frank think about this first Mike's Chili? Okay, so Frank basically says for you over here, holy crap, what the hell is this stuff? You could remove dried paint from your driveway. It took me two beers to put the flames out. I hope that this is the worst one, and that I hope these Texans, uh, or these Texans are crazy. So this was his first expression of a relationship between something that he had and his first uh, uh, beer that he had to consume, okay? So now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk now about a little bit of, about biological monitoring, okay? There are forms of monitoring. One is an, ex an external exposure, which is, could be something in the air. It can be uh, a volatile. It can be uh, 
solvents or whatever, and you can monitor the environmental impact of that on humans. That's not what we in this audience find a lot to do. A lot of times we deal with what's called biological monitoring, which is the internal dose. That is, you go to a doctor, the doctor gives you a medication, he or she wants you to take that in a way in which the hope is that you'll, you'll get the drug, you'll get it in such a, a level that it will produce the desirable effect within you and will minimize the potential chances for any kind of side effects or adverse effects. That's called the therapeutic range. In addition, you're also sometimes asked to administer what's perceived to be some adverse effect that you're experiencing. And by having a drug tested or a level tested, the doctor is able to get some idea so that either A, they can reduce the dose or change it to a different medication in order to maximize the beneficial effect and minimize the adverse effects. So those are the forms of monitoring. Now, there's basically two approaches once you take something. In it, as a human. There's what's called the pharmacokinetics, and that's what, uh, that's what you do to the drug. That is, you take it, it goes, we'll talk about how it gets into your system. You take it, it enters the blood, uh, blood circulating system, it, it gets distributed throughout the body in certain parameters based on its structure. It, uh, and then it is also then um, metabolized because most things that we take the body recognizes as foreign and wants to get rid of it and then ultimately by this metabolic process it will eliminate it. So pharmacokinetics, especially with things like alcohol and others, come into play a lot. Pharmacodynamics is what the actual drug does to you because in that setting the drug ultimately gets into the systemic circulation, it ultimately gets into wherever the site of action is and it binds to some sort of receptor site in, in the body, exerting an effect, mm -hmm. and hopefully you'll get the desired um, clinical mm -hmm. response and to get the efficacious approach, or if the pharmacological effect is high enough, then you begin to get the toxicity or, as I said, the adverse effect. So pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics are terms that you may hear if you're talking with people in toxicology or if you're reading literature relating to uh, various drugs. Okay. Now, the, the useful term that I wanted to bring up more importantly is the term half-life because many of you will ask me, well, Dr. Trudy, they took this trimethyl chicken wire and I want to know, and I got a level of so-and-so, can you tell me what it was at the time of the incident when he or she was driving a car, did whatever? Well, the, the half-life principle is based on the fact that when you and I take a drug, and I'll just use a simple example, and we take it for the first time, it reaches a peak, and we take a blood sample out, and we measure it, and all of a sudden the, we'll say that the level is 100 units. And we're saying that the half-life of that drug is 10 hours. So if it has 100 units and the half-life is at 10 hours, in about 10 hours, it'll have 50 units. And in another 10 hours, it'll have 25, 12 and a half. That's assuming you don't take the drug again, OK? Now, much of what we deal with in terms of whether it's prescription drugs or illicit drug sometimes the individual is using it with some rapidity. And so therefore, it's, it's hard to say exactly what the level would have been a specific time based on the fact that the individual is using the drug. And in many cases, it's an illicit drug, and the truth is we don't even know what the concentration is or the purity or that sort of thing. So the half-life is important. Volume of distribution is really important when you deal with things like alcohol because it's, it's what percentage of the body in relationship to what's in the blood where the alcohol goes and in men it's about 68 percent and about <coughs> in women it's about 55 percent based on a little bit more uh, fat that women have okay so just a brief idea about routes of administration because that again is fundamentally important most of the things we take are taken by the oral route of administration there are medication that you can take where you put it in under your tongue, you put it uh, uh, up the gazunza and rectally. Uh, but a lot of times, unrelated to that, people who use these drugs
can use them by inhalation, for example, smoking, which is a common thing in illicit drugs, or it can be intravenous where it's put directly into the vein. Uh, and, and I listed the other ones, IM and subcutaneous, don't really, or transdermal, are not things within, in the milieu in which we exist are common. But you need to understand in the back of your mind a little bit about where, how the person's taking the drug in order to get some understanding of, again, the pharmacokinetics, how long it's going to take for it to absorb into the stomach of the small intestine before it gets into the system. Okay, so thank goodness most of you in this audience deal with people who are alive, or sometimes you hope that they're alive. They may not be talking to you in a way that you would think they're alive, but in any event, when you deal with anti-mortem samples, Primarily, you and I deal with blood and its, and its off-spin, meaning the plasma or the serum, depending upon how it's processed, potentially maybe in a hospital setting or in a crime lab. Urine. But in addition to, in today's toxicological environment, we can use saliva, we can use sweat patches, we can use expired breath. And many of you now are involved in hair follicle testing. Uh, because hair gives you some uh, information that uh, other biological fluids may not give, but it also has a limited explanation relative to the fact that it is a hair test, and we'll go into that later on. And just for completeness, we're dealing with postmortem. I only give you two points that you ought to know about postmortem uh, in case any of your clients, siblings, or somebody passed away, is that in general at autopsy, the toxicologist or the deaner or the medical examiner tries to get two types of blood. One is central blood, which is usually directly out of the heart. Peripheral blood is really out the femoral vein or something. It's distal. And there's a reason for that because the reason for that is um, uh, taken directly from the heart, you can have what's called postmortem redistribution, which may give you an artificially high or lower level, but it's the easiest blood to get. But you need to be able to get it from peripheral blood if you can as well. In addition, the vitreous, which is the fluid within the eye, is a really good fluid because it's circumscribed and it's not subjected to any kind of problems after the individual passes away. Okay? So the first probably fundamentally useful piece of information to you at this point is that we're dealing with methods to analyze, and there's two different approaches within laboratories that we deal with. One is we want to get the most information in the relatively short period of time and at the least amount of cost to the lab. And that's usually trying to do it in a, in a qualitative sense. It's a, it's a preliminary screening test, which tells us something about what we're looking for, and, and depending upon the results, we now then have a presumptive positive, okay? It's like saying, we want to know if in this bowl of water there are fish. So we're going to take a, some water out and we're going to test to see if there's fish. Now, if we do this test on it and it's positive for fish, we don't know whether it's a salmon or a flounder or a halibut or a shark or whatever. We just know it's a fish. We need to go to the next level. Now, many of the things you deal with in your arena turn out to be variations on that because sometimes you get these point-of-care devices where somebody does a test on somebody right on the spot. It's a screening technique. It says it's positive for amphetamines. And immediately the person is, whoever it might be, is implying that you're dirty, you have a dirty test, that kind of thing. Okay, that's, the, that's what they get right away. But the reality is that's not really what it's saying, and we'll go into that. You need to have within, a, within the laboratory a confirmatory test, which both reflects, again, the qualitative positivity of the test. But now we go one step further. We can separate these complex mixtures into individual components. And now we know whether it's a halibut or a flounder or a shark. And we know how much it weighs, if you will, because we can do the quantitative level based on the responses that we get in the confirmatory <coughs> test. Very important fundamentally. And then there's some other variations on that that are important as well. So if you're looking at methods of analysis, um, 
I listed the ones just for completeness, the ones that are most commonly used in, in forensic laboratories. The ones that you will primarily get involved in, I think, would either be immunoassays, GC mass spec, so-called gas, ma uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. In some newer locations, we'll use liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry together, together. And I'll explain later on a little bit why that's important. But these are the common methods that are used. Sometimes in breath tests relating to, for example, the presence of alcohol, we may use a, a, a pass instrument out in the field, but then you'll also maybe use something at a location, and then that, it's still come, sometimes it's called ECIR, in which the instrument is now has a infrared component, which is able to do some things that the PATH instrument out in the field can't do. Now, you don't have to know all the particulars, of, but you need to know fundamentally what's going on between these two diverse uh, instrumental approaches. Okay, I, again, what I thought I would do is just be able to give you some idea with your handout, essentially what actually happened. In this case, we're looking for alcohol, and the infrared is looking at certain wavelengths, so you can see the CH stretch within alcohol, which is CH3, CH2OH, very small molecule, and you can get this spectrum, which then sort of rules out the presence of other things that might compete with another volatile that might not be ethanol, it may be something else. So that's sort of a general approach to that, and you can you can use that approach, but you can also use other types of immunoassays. The most common ones that you come in contact with is either in a blood sample, it will be the ELISA method, okay? Sometimes <coughs> in, in older labs they'll use an RIA technique, but ELISA. And in the, home, and in the urine test, which you get a lot of where people uh, uh, have it tested, the EMIT procedure is the, uh, is the common one, most common. Uh, in a urine sample. Now again, remember the immunoassay is based on an antigen antibody response, which is another way of saying the drug acts as the antigen and the antibodies are produ produced to interact with it to give a response of yes, it's there, or it's, it has the backbone of a substance that is there, or it doesn't. Because the real value to the, to the lab is if you do the test, and it's negative, you don't go any further. You haven't gone to some elaborate, time-consuming, very expensive technique. The only fallacy with that is, the assumption is it's negative at a certain cutoff point. And there are some times when it could be present, but it's below the cutoff. And when you're dealing with very sensitive, high-power consequences, some people in some cases might have that actually tested with a lower cut off just to see if you can make a case that the, the drug was or was not present. Okay, now I put this here because again, I know many of you get, get reports back and, and, and it implies that you, you have a result. And again, much of this is related to the screening test that you get back. And what normally has is sometimes it will say, we did a, a a drug panel for screening in five or six different drugs, and all of a sudden we got a positive uh, benzodiazepines. Okay, so it was positive for benzodiazepines. The reality is that the submitting agency or the hospital usually says something along these lines. It's a preliminary screening. If you want to know specifically what it is, it needs to be confirmed, which means you need to submit another aliquot of that sample or you need to let us know and then we'll do a confirmatory test. The problem in all candor that you, what you have is most of the time, at the time you get the case, this sample has long been destroyed because usually laboratories will keep the drug for 7 to 14 days. If, if it's in a crime lab and they actually do the confirmatory test or whatever, it's usually there for a year, if it's, even if it's presumptive positive. So, so my point is you need to only be aware that the initial result that you get back may not mean exactly what you think it means because it hasn't gone to the next step. And I see that all the time.
Hmm. Okay, I don't know what that is. Oh. Oh, well, I did. Well, did I do something to this that makes it go one by one by one? I don't know. Because it will be here three hours, just me doing this. I mean, it's very nice work. Whoever did this did a marvelous job. Okay. So in an antigen antibody reaction, this is the antigenic binding site, which is another way of saying that's where the drug acts. So once you have the antigen antibody reaction, then you'll have a response, which then can be looked at in an instrument, and the intensity of that response will ultimately tell you whether that drug class is present or not. That's just a very simple way of, of showing that. Yeah, I, I got a big problem here. Okay, uh, I'll go through these really fast. The third one is what I wanted you to be aware of. This is the important step in the immunoassay procedure. That is the coupling, because that tells you whether it's positive or not. Um, Okay, now the, the technique that you will most likely be involved with <coughs> is a variation on gas chromatography. Gas chromatography is a separation technique. It, it separates complex mixtures into individual components. The detector can be a variety of things, but the one that's most common today is the so-called mass spect uh, spectrogram, mass spectroscopy which then bombards the, the, the material as it comes to the detector and it breaks it into fragment ions. And then the computer, the data system, puts them back together and now can tell you very subtle differences between compounds that are very, very closely related, which older systems can't do. So in that sense, you could, you could separate, for example, amphetamines into methamphetamine, amphetamine, MDMA, ecstasy, all kinds of variations that was positive by the screening technique, but now you know which one it is and you'll know how much of it is present. So GCMS is a really good technique. What I did is just put a simple example here of methamphetamine where the, the detector bombards it, breaks it into component ions. They know, what, they know what ions the, to look for within the parameters of the, of the uh, instrumentation, and then they can, again, put it back together and know if indeed methamphetamine is there and how much. And this is a, this is a, um, a mass spec of what they do when they break down the component ions and what the intensity it is. And then at the very end, they will put it together and say, this represents... Uh, a certain drug, a phenylethylamine, which is what amphetamines are. Okay, now once you've got the once you've got the analytical approach, then you start dealing with do you have any information relative to what's going on in the person? And one of the most important aspects is for many of the drugs that affect the body, especially if they affect the, the brain, they will also affect the eye. Okay? So sometimes you may be reading reports or narratives or whatever when they talk about they found this person and this is the kind of symptomology they were dealing with. In general, the ocular manifestations can be related to the, uh, the, uh, how the eye looks, how the eye responds to light, the pupil size, and is there any strange movements within the eye. And I'll just briefly go through a couple of those. The most common one, and you've all seen it, uh, if, if you've dealt with the alcohol, of course, is red, bloodshot, watery eyes. The world has that, as if that's indicative makes your client <coughs> guilty as charged. That doesn't mean that way. There's a variety of different drugs that will cause that. And if you have, for example, ex excess lacrimation or tearing, marijuana will do that. If you have red sclera that's red, sclera is the white portion of the eye, and if it's red, Sometimes you will have that with marijuana, also certain inhalants. And then the size of the pupil is extremely important because two major classifications are stimulants and depressants. And pure stimulant or pure depressants will cause significant changes to the size of the pupil of the eye. Narcotics tend to cause meiosis or pinpoint pupils. Stimulants cause dilation or medriasis. And so that's sometimes helpful. It doesn't always mean that uh, 
that it, it relates to the drug. Some people have pupil sizes inherently that are outside those levels. 5% have levels bigger than 6.5 or lower than 3 millimeters. So, it's, but it's something that we use. The pupil size, as I said, you can see from this person here, that pupil is very enlarged, even at room light, which would imply in some cases if you were concerned about somebody's misuse of a, of a stimulant drug, in a pure stimulant drug, you see this. Drugs like methamphetamine.